What is this? Do you think this is funny? Shut up! You're like the 26 millionth person to type this fucking joke into the internet! Do you think people care? No, you dumbass! And why would you want them to? You wanna be friends with the shit smeared mongoloids that like this stupid fucking meme garbage? Let me warn you, if you ever type that fucking sentence again, I'll know. And next time, I will fucking eat your limbs! Do you understand? You putrid fucking cunt! Uh, uh, I guess I'll have to find something else to comment. Goku vs. Superman! Welcome back to every episode of Death Battle, reviewed in 10 words or less. We're reaching the home stretch now. Last time in the series showed off what it's truly capable of when all the stars align just right, giving us some of the best episodes of the whole show, as well as next to zero stinkers. But here's the kicker. Season 5 may have been godlike, but now all the pressure is on Season 6 to follow it up. Kind of like how people are so hard on Legend of Korra, following up a masterpiece like Avatar is a bit of an undertaking to say the least. So does this season manage to live up to the hype? Do we get an episode as good as Mario vs. Sonic? Did the decision to make Wiz and Boomstick animated characters pay off? Why am I asking you all these questions? Let's just go ahead and get into the reviews and see for ourselves. Ready? Go! I deem this more of a soak than a splash. Black holes kill robots, apparently. How about that? Then I fired again, and I missed. Is this episode supposed to be a personal attack? Fart jokes are funny, don't at me. This one's great, y'all are just mean. Still think Death Battle's biased? Falcon brought his car to a fist fight. Decent, but this one comes up a little short. Ghost Rider Vor- Yeah, I think you guys get the point. Uh, I stepped away from my keyboard, did I miss something? Well, that was surprising. Lee Awesome! Gothic, memorable, brutal. More SFM content, please! Eh, this battle's alright, I guess. Psych! If the Looney Tunes, Disney, and Chowder had a love child, no denying that this mighty battle went beyond. Plus Ultra! Holla freaking Luya, we've done it! No more backtracking like with Season 3. No more confusion like with Season 4. No more growing pains, period! Death Battle has finally managed to keep the ball rolling and then some. Sure, we had some episodes that were only average, and Aang vs. Edward reeks of untapped potential, but I honestly can't think of a single fight this season that I outright disliked. Needless to say, there once again won't be a worst list. But now the real challenge is choosing a favorite and not leaving anyone out, which is really hard this time. I guess that's what honorable mentions are for after all. Sasuke vs. Hiei seems like the whole package. Great choreography, fantastic art, voice acting that it admittedly starts rough but gets better as the fight progresses. The one thing about it, though, that frustrates me to no end is how little I care about these characters. I want to like this episode more, and if it came out in another, lesser season, it'd probably be number one. But when so many episodes are this good in one season, something's got to give. Oh, you probably thought I was frustrated about the result being supposedly wrong. Again, do you have any idea who you're talking to here? Black Widow vs. Widowmaker isn't the most popular fight this season, but after numerous rewatches, I've concluded that I really enjoyed it. The colors are beautiful, and I love the choice to set this at night during a cold winter snow. It gets across how cold-blooded these two are, literally and figuratively. The decision to have most of the fight take place from a distance has split most watchers, but I enjoyed this direction. It makes sense given they're both snipers, and there are more enticing sets pieces at play when compared to a similar fight like Green Arrow vs. Hawkeye. It was basically a question of whether or not Black Widow can narrow the gap. Once she got in close, it was basically lights out for Widowmaker, and damn was it intense. The actresses sounded badass as well. Natalie Vance's team sold me with this line alone. <laughs> I'm a goddamn Avenger. And Jeannie Torado was a standout too. I wonder if she's been in anything else. Ah, uh, fire up, love! <laughs> Ghost Rider vs. Lobo is the pinnacle of badass despite being yet another Marvel vs. DC episode. Unlike my geek of a colleague, Cameron, Hey, I heard that, buddy. 
Comic episodes just don't excite me anymore due to how frequent they've gotten. It's to the point where an episode has to do a lot to grab my attention, which is part of why Aquaman vs. Namor got docked. But I can't ignore how freaking cool this one is. The voice acting is some of the best from this season. Lobo feels like he's voiced by John DiMaggio, something I would never say lightly. I'm gonna skull frack ya! He's voiced by Lord Jazzer, who previously did Deathstroke. Fitting that he returned to play a character who's essentially an overpowered version of he who shall not be mentioned. I'm super happy with the direction they went with for Ghost Rider, because it leads to a death that would probably go in my top five for the show. You wanna know why? build up. Ghost Rider begins the battle with his usual speech that gets interrupted abruptly. He tries finishing things quickly by doing the penance stare, which is great, and is once again interrupted. Your soul will burn in hell. I like your funny words, magic man. At this point, we can hear now he's getting more and more annoyed with Lobo's antics, as evidenced by Stephen Kelly's exasperation. Next, Zarathos comes out, bringing this episode to a whole new level of badassery. You will all die streaming. But then Lobo blows him up with his rocket launcher. By this point, he's beyond pissed. So seeing him finally bring Lobo down a peg and actually get to finish his speech from earlier now has a brand new layer of catharsis. Not to mention the fact that DC had been on a ridiculous winning streak up to this point. It may not be the most gory death, but it's all about the context that makes it so satisfying and thrilling. And it's a visual treat with the incredible sprite work as well as an Earthbound reference. I'm honestly pissed at myself for excluding this one from the list. But like I said, something's got to give. Fate. Finally, I'd like to give super brief shoutouts to Captain Marvel vs. Shazam, Weiss vs. Mitsuru, and Dragonzord vs. Mecha Godzilla. On their own, these are all great episodes. They're unfortunately overshadowed by the rest of the season for me. Each one has killer music, beautiful animation that shows how far the show has come, and standout voice acting. With notable highlights for me, including Hitomi Farrell as Akane Yashiro, this show's first Japanese speaking voice actor, Corey Petit making her epic return to YouTube as Mitsuru, and Michael Kovach as Shazam, a man who's most known for playing Angel Dust. No, I'm not kidding. Oh, geez, stop, stop, stop! Stop right there! Huh? You really think you can get away with something so petty? I can suck your dick. Say the line, Bart! Time, huh? Ben 10 vs. Green Lantern Ben vs. Hal, all controversy aside, is one that I love, but can understand where people who don't like it are coming from. Obviously, I don't agree with the scissors being a legitimate criticism, but the lackluster results analysis, time travel logic, and death that is for some reason gorier than Carnage vs. Lucy are understandable complaints. Though, to be fair, I've always thought that death was pretty satisfying given the amount of hell Hal got put through, and the fact that it's a kid getting smushed by a comically oversized boot makes it hard not to laugh. Can I get an instant replay on that one? Beautiful. Speaking of Carnage vs. Lucy, the animation has this beautiful blending of sprites and hand-drawn that lead to fantastic moments like the supernova and Wade Big's hand-to-hand -hand combat. The voices are incredible, and it's impressive hearing Nicholas Andrew Louie do so many distinct voices at once, even if hearing a Teen Ben voice come out of Kid Ben's sprites is a little weird. Here's hoping we get more Bradley Gareth in the future. While he's mostly famous for this line, we shouldn't forget that his performance here is actually really good. Wiz and Boomstick have great bits like the Yellow Elephant, as well as this adorable bonding moment. Emerald Heroes is one of the best tracks this show has ever made. You just can't deny it. This episode may get bogged down by quite a few little issues, but the good far outweighs the bad in my opinion. And I'm pretty annoyed that this is the episode to surpass Goku vs Superman 2 in terms of dislike ratio. Do you people have no good taste in memes? I'm talking to you, Steve! Johnny Cage vs. Captain Falcon If I were forced to describe this episode in one word alone, my answer without a doubt would be hype. Every damn time I watch this one, it feels like the very first. But it's not all that surprising given the characters chosen for a matchup I don't think anyone could have predicted. Johnny is one of those larger-than-life characters that helps keep fighting game rosters from taking themselves too seriously. And if you've ever played a single game of Smash Brothers, then you already know what makes Captain Falcon such an indisputably exciting fighter that can bring life to any crowd. Too bad he can't do the same for his franchise. Hey yo! This episode excels at showing why these two make everyone so pumped up. My favorite moments include when Johnny slowly walks up to Falcon after a huge combo, and their funny exchange after the nut punch. You know what they say, all's fair in show business. Nobody says that! The voice acting is really solid, especially with Captain Falcon. In Smash Bros, Falcon has always been voiced by one legendary man, the Japanese voice actor for Vegeta. But his lines have always been recycled from the first game, making his voice clips sound the most dated out of the whole cast. It'd be like if they never updated Donkey Kong's voice. It just doesn't fit. 
The only other time Ryo got brought back was to do slurping sounds. Classy. Falcon essentially sounds like a Japanese man trying to sound as American as possible, something that'd be hard to replicate in a setting like Death Battle, but the decision to recruit Keston Howard of YouTube fame totally paid off. The constant back and forth combos feel like a dance, which is even better rhythmically speaking when set to Falcon Uncaged, and the momentum just keeps picking up, much like a race, to the point where they end up fighting on freaking booster pads. Now that's a creative use of environment. I know a lot of people were miffed about Falcon using his car to win, but those same detractors seem to forget that the car wasn't even mentioned once in the ending analysis. Plus, who cares? It looks cool. I'm pretty sure Boomstick represented a lot of us once the final blow was landed, leading to material for my best list transitions. <laughs> Here's hoping he achieves his life goal of becoming the next Captain Falcon. He should be fine so long as he doesn't try to punch Wiz in the nuts again. Only one can be worthy after all. Super fighting! <laughs> Mega Man Battle Royale. Thinking about the number of battle royales this show's had is very revealing. Including this one, there are only three. And while Ratchet and Clank vs. Jack and Daxter and Power Rangers vs. Voltron don't technically count, they would still only bring the number up to a handful. Not to mention Eggman vs. Wily and Ultron vs. Sigma using entire armies. Basically, any fight with more than two characters becomes a hell of a lot more complicated to create. Which begs the question, how high were they when they decided to start off the season with such an overwhelmingly complicated fight? The answer is negligible because I'm so happy they did this. Which man is the most mega? While it may be obvious now in hindsight, that doesn't detract from the scope and excitement of this one. I still can't believe how well this episode handled five different characters at once while remaining cohesive and keeping each one distinct. I would have liked a little bit more of a free-for-all touch like in the beginning as opposed to switching between two one-on-one -on -one fights while Volana is just kinda there. That being said, I'm very lenient with this episode's choreography due to the sheer magnitude, and the Volnut teasing is a great running gag. Due to the lack of story and voices, there's even potential for fun headcanons. For example, I like to believe that Classic targeted X the whole fight specifically because he knew X was designed to be better than him, so he was jealous and felt like he needed to prove himself to his papa. Imagine if your parents adopted a sibling that was specifically better than you in every way. That shit can mess with a kid's head. Mega Mania captures everything I love about Mega Man music and is still one of my favorite tracks of the show. Wiz and Boomstick are at their best here and tell a lot of great jokes that put into perspective how progressively batshit insane Mega Man gets with each passing spinoff. Boomstick's Legends rant in particular is legendary, no pun intended. This is the beefiest in length an episode has gotten in a long time, and it could have felt long given the amount of characters used, but the analysis has great pacing, feeling concise while also not leaving out anything important. Thanks, Information Tabs! Season 6 had my curiosity, but this is the episode that grabbed my attention. What's up, bro? What, bro? What's up, bro? Take a swing, bro! Right here, bro! All Might vs. Mike Guy. Two Incredibles references in one video? If that doesn't scream finale-worthy, I I don't know what does. As great as Season 6 is, I'll be the first to admit that it's not very consistent when it comes to 3D fights. By Season 4, Torian started moving away from solo work and got assistance in the form of Jerome. Then, starting with Season 5, we got our dynamic trio of Torian, Christina, and David, and they've been great together. Fast forward to Season 6, and we've been getting a lot more individuals helping out and joining the 3D team. Now, I don't want to go pointing fingers, but ever since then, 3D fights have started getting less and less exciting. Don't get it twisted. The 3D fights this season have been great episodes, and they're really beautiful in terms of art. But something about the choreography and staging just lacks the same punch that early Torian episodes had. It's kind of like when Monty left Red vs. Blue. Yeah, the animation looks more polished, but they don't feel as pedal-to-the-metal action-packed as before, and lack the same amount of weight. Not helping is that some of these animations feel the need to skip right to the fighting without any kind of introduction, which severely hurts the crossover aspect of this show. Then there's All Might vs. Might Guy, or Might Might for short. It went Went back to the basics and was only worked on by our dynamic trio once again. As expected, these three knocked it out of the park and into the next town over. Sure, the animation isn't the smoothest, but I've grown to love choppier animation thanks to stuff like Into the Spider-Verse. It's full of personality and allows a whole new level of potential action not possible with the budget and time constraints that come from being more fluid. Like I said before, 3D fights have become a lot more visually appealing lately, focusing more on stylized models as opposed to realistic ones. I find this method complements the show much better and will help these episodes age like wine in the long run. Not unlike Balrog vs. TJ Combo, this fight focuses more on hand-to-hand, -hand, and I've already said why 
fight is holds up better when compared to more complicated fights like Dragon Sword vs. Mecha Godzilla. Even then, Might Might has plenty of epic and beautiful moments not possible in live action, with Daytime Tiger and Texas Smash being notable highlights. I'm frankly amazed that this show still finds new ways to blow my mind with its choreography and effects. All Might's hits feel like they collide with the force of a freight train, and I love the use of cinematography whenever Guy goes into breakdance mode. It's as if the camera has a personality of its own. This episode also excels at making these two feel in character, a major problem I had with Aang vs. Edward Elric. They have mutual respect for each other throughout, and it never feels like there's any malice behind their actions, which is incredibly unique for a death battle premise. It starts off as a freaking arm wrestling contest that, for some reason, destroys the ground before destroying the table. Huh. The voice actors are great at embodying these pillars of justice. This is Kaiji Tang's fourth episode on the show, so it's safe to say that he's officially a series regular. And rightfully so. I have no idea who voiced Guy, but according to Alejandro Saab, the voice of Hercule Satan, Jason, and Edward Elric... And that's Xander Mobis, aka Joker, aka Persona 5, aka he better f***ing win. I'd like to believe him, seeing how confident he is, and this would be a great return for him after nearly four years of a hiatus. It would also be fitting given the crowd sound effects taken straight out of Home Run Contest, as well as all of the moves with Smash in their name. Mighty has a lot of Emerald Heroes vibes, and it's so damn inspiring. Up there with Wings of Iron, Therewolf and Brandon Yates together at last. But now the important question, is this episode finale worthy? In my eyes? Yes. The problem with Sephiroth vs. Virgil is that it doesn't have much to separate it from any other episode. Pokemon vs. Digimon is a franchise rivalry, Deadpool vs. Pinkie Pie is hopping mad, and Thanos vs. Darkseid has cosmic proportions. Might Might is like the perfect antithesis of Season 5's finale when you think about it. It features two characters that are inspiring showcases of what it truly means to be a hero, and it's more down to Earth. Uh, for the most part, at least. There is still a gaping hole in the actual Earth's crust by the end of the fight. If you ask me, I'd say its finale status is more than well earned. For featuring two iconic anime characters that serve as shining examples of pure selflessness and heroism, something that's important now more than Quick, ever. Rewind it! Mob vs. Tatsumaki. The fact that this episode got me into Mob Psycho 100 is reason enough for me to place it so high, but we all know it takes a bit more than that to make an episode extraordinary. It's a fight between one's most powerful espers, and it's batshit insane in the best ways possible. I've made it no secret that I'm much more of a hand-to-hand -hand kind of guy when it comes to fight scenes. Because of that, I wasn't expecting to get much out of this episode going in. How exciting could a fight between characters that barely have to lift a finger be anyway? But don't forget, we're in the renaissance of Death Battle, where there's a will, there's a way. And if watching Tatsumaki lift a city from the ground to split it in half wasn't enough to convince me, then there's truly no hope in my barren soul. This episode is gorgeous, and it falls neatly into the same category as Carnage vs. Lucy and Ben vs. Hal when it comes to presentation style. However, I think this episode utilizes hand-drawn elements to the greatest degree, plus it doesn't nearly ruin the show's reputation, which is always nice, whereas those previous episodes sprinkled in hand-drawn here and there, this one is oozing with it. The drawback to that is that the choice in art style itself is a little all over the place given there are so many different animators, but it doesn't bother me as much as something like Metal Sonic vs. Zero because of its striking beauty, and it at least gives the animators a chance to make funny references to one's own art style. Now, an obvious question would be why didn't they just make the entire episode hand-drawn, barring the obvious zoot suit in the room. By making this a sprite battle, I feel it gives the hand-drawn moments a lot more punch. Whenever these fights change their appearance, that tends to occur whenever they demand your immediate attention. This episode just happens to be bursting with attention-grabbing moments, and it's impossible to pry my eyes away from the non-stop back-and-forth battle of minds. I love the decision to map both of their powers to specific colors, otherwise all this debris Tossing would have been nigh impossible to keep up with. As mind-blowing as these mind games are, the best part of this episode is without question the characterization. Death Battle has done so much to improve lately, but something I feel still needs a little reworking are the fight setups. I get that it's tough giving characters a reason to go all out, especially ones that don't kill, but this show is all about faithful representation. I suppose the solution to this would be skipping the setup altogether, but that's the easy way out. Death Battle should really be taking a page out of All Might vs. Might Guy, which I've already discussed, and Mob vs. Tatsumaki. Anime is a very strange thing when it comes to age, so I don't blame Good Boy Mob for assuming Tatsu was a middle schooler, and we all know that Tatsu is hot-blooded when she's not shown respect, so when Mob brushed aside her powers and told her off like it was nothing, there was no going back from that. Also, contrary to popular belief, Mob doesn't go from 0 to 62% in this scene. If you stop the frame, he actually starts at 40%. Mob's percentage is constantly going up in the show from little annoyances, so the fact that he's this high up before the fight 
fight even begins is realistic and great attention to detail. Take note of how he's mostly redirecting and defending here as opposed to outright attacking. He doesn't actually fight back until he reaches 100%, and based on his dialogue, it's safe to say that his personality has clearly shifted away from innocent bystander to potential school shooter. I wouldn't be surprised if a 100% mob had his own Enchi Sonic OC to boot. From here, the fight keeps escalating, and once the immeasurable state appears, I actually get scared for Tatsu. This is a good moment to bring up what a great job Bo Bridgeland and Jennifer Alex do as our prodigy espers. Bo transitions from good boy to angsty psycho fabulously, and while Jennifer is great at capturing Tatsu's ego, she's also great at sounding panicked and screaming in pain. Not to mention her reactions are freaking hysterical. What? Tatsu may have won in the end, but I don't think we've ever seen a winner get as fucked up as her in the show. Sure, some have lost their limbs, but she had hers twisted like a freaking pretzel. Even though I was rooting for Mob, it makes Tatsu's victory way more badass and sells how incredibly close this fight was. Who would have guessed that the tipping point to any debate in the show would be a reverse Uno and the science of how broccoli is cooked? Don't be sad, fellow Mob Psycho fans. Let's all take solace in the fact that out of 100 fights, Mob would have reasonably taken 40 or so of them. Wario vs. King DDD. One of the few fights in the show where if someone disagrees, then they can feel free to settle it in SMASH! Now, I'm not gonna call myself a fanboy due to the negative connotations around that word, not to mention recent drama, but I won't hide how much Nintendo means to me, so getting another Smash Bros. themed episode is just fine by me. While Might 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 be inspiring, and the Wonder Twins may be exciting, Wario vs. King DDD is simply hysterical. Perhaps therein lies part of the reason why I love Nintendo so much. They're one of the few AAA video game companies around that isn't afraid to go crazy with their characters and focus purely on fun. These are the same people that turned Reggie into a Terminator and created a pocket-sized Planet Buster after all. Appropriate that for a Nintendo-themed fight, it's easily one of the most fun episodes of the show. While it has plenty of cool action, Wario vs. King DDD has the makings of a classic Looney Tunes short, helmed by two of Nintendo's goofiest, toon forciest characters imagined. I suppose at this point I should expect each season to have at least one battle without voice actors to go above and beyond the Call of Duty, but while Shredder vs. Silver Samurai and Ryu vs. Jin did this to enhance the fighting, Wario vs. DDD took a page out of Tom and Jerry by focusing on the slapstick. They're two of the most famous silent film stars in animation because of how succinct and universal their comedy is, telling the story mostly through facial expressions and music alone. At first it seems like this battle is going to be another generic sprite fight, but it's easy to tell that something is amiss. When in the history of death battle have the combatants started in their final transformations? Once their costumes come off, this is when things come together and minds are slightly blown. While some say the flashback scene distracts from the action, I say it provides motivation for fighting beyond the superficial because Wiz and Boomstick said so, which adds more meaning to their actions now that things have gotten personal, and they accomplish this without uttering a single line of dialogue. Telling a story while also incorporating jokes is hard enough on its own, but doing so with only facial expressions and simple grunts takes true artistic talent. You'd think that because it's sprites, a slapstick wouldn't hit as hard, but there's still plenty of cartoon staples such as squash and stretch and action reaction used to full effect, despite the lack of hand drawing. There's even moments that almost feel like homages to similar cartoons. So, what about the music? Well, Appetite for Greed happens to be yet another one of my favorite tracks in the show and compliments the characters flawlessly. It's not only a bop in its own right, but the use of EXTRA THICK bass is a perfect embodiment of these oversized bodies. As the great Sammo Hung and Ping Zhao Po taught us, never underestimate an opponent who's a little on the chubby side. It feels really weird to say that Wario vs. King Dedede's story is up there with the likes of Snake vs. Sam Fisher, but that's the power of silent filmmaking for ya. We're not just here to see two asshats beat the shit out of each other. We also want to see our favorite characters given proper justice. That's what makes these last three entries so special to me. Wario vs. King Dedede happens to be highest simply because it leaves me on the floor. That may sound like a cheap reason to some, but you've also got to understand that Emperor's New Groove is in my top three favorite Disney movies. I'm sorry, but you've thrown off the Emperor's Groove. I'm a sucker for absurdism, which is what makes this episode so difficult to talk about any further. There are only so many ways I can say a joke made me laugh. And yes, even the fart jokes! Funny sound design, funny voice clips, funny Gordo, funny windbreaker, funny fun 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 fun! What more can I talk about without sounding redundant? Um, uh, I guess you could say this episode is so good, we took the penguin? Oh, brother, this guy stinks! 
How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? Ganondorf versus Dracula. It seems as if we found ourselves in quite the 180 of a situation. Back in season three, Ganon's episode was by far my least favorite. Fast forward three years later, and now he's in my favorite episode of season six. What the heck happened? Quite a few things actually that has led to this being one of the show's most beloved episodes in recent memory, due in no small part to the brand new animation team. As glad as I am that Death Battle toned it down on the frequency of 3D fights, I have to admit that at the time, I didn't miss them given they're the best episodes of the show. Ben and the crew realized this predicament and knew they needed some extra manpower to help satisfy our tastes for 3D, even if it meant using an entirely new animation program. SFM has an interesting reputation to say the least. It's where most 3D animators get their start since the learning curve isn't nearly as high as other programs like Blender or Unreal. It's essentially to CG what Flash is to hand-drawn animation. Because of this low entry hurdle, you have to trudge through a lot of cringe to get to the actual works of art. Death Battle needed to find individuals with experience and talent, which is easier said than done. Most people who use SFM are just starting and don't really know what they're doing right away, and for those who are experienced, they usually move on to more powerful programs anyway. Who could possibly be up to the task of animating something as complex as a death battle? Enter the SFM team, Daito Madachi, Duvad Hodan, and Devil Artemis. All three of these guys are talented creators in their own right, and they each bring their own set of skills and style to the table. Daito, who is known for his humorous slice-of-life skits, Duvad, famous for My Smash Academia and other action shorts, and Devil Artemis, arguably the most prolific of the trio with his ongoing Cell vs. series. David Fisher is on board for this fight as well, and we all know how talented he is already. With the four Ds coming together in perfect harmony, we were given an episode that wouldn't have been nearly as memorable had it gone with the original sprite idea, thereby providing the proper Ganon episode us Zelda fans have been waiting for. That being said, was this episode solely created as a spite match against Ganondorf? While I certainly get that perspective, I prefer to look at this episode in a less cynical light. It doesn't just pretend like Bowser vs. Ganon doesn't exist. It feels like they've acknowledged their mistakes in the past and genuinely took fan feedback to heart. Like with how they treat Holy Weaponry, for instance. Hell, we even see glimpses of this attitude as far back as Ghost Rider vs. Lobo, where they go out of their way to explicitly prove that Rider is only affected by Holy Weapons. Even then, they still bring up this. Yeah, but who needs Holy Weapons? when you're strong enough to crush a whole city. Couldn't he just overpower Johnny? A good question. However, do you recall how powerful Zarathos was? It shows how much they've grown, and I'm immensely proud of the team's humility regarding this controversy. And, and like, with so stuff like, like, yeah, Bowser will probably win, and then, like, yeah, two weeks into research, it was like, oh, shit. Well, you can't really kill Gain <laughs> either, and you can curse him from the inside, and all this other bullshit, so, yeah. <laughs> Wait, never mind. Actually, there's magic. <laughs> can't yeah. forget about magic. And you are doing so well. I'm just gonna pretend I didn't hear that. Actually, when watching both Ganon episodes back to back, I've realized how much this show has improved not just with animation, but even analysis. Ignoring the obvious presentation upgrades with Wiz and Boomstick being on screen, the writing does a much better job of telling brilliant jokes and investing in the lore of these characters' universes. Be honest, what's more memorable? A jarring Attack of the Clones reference, or Boomstick's six-step plan to becoming a vampire? This is the first episode of the show to feel like a proper Halloween fight. Not only did it come out around the holiday, the SFM team did a fantastic job filling this episode to the brim with gothic imagery that chills to the bone. Look no further than this establishing shot with Ganon walking up to the castle, which itself is impressively rendered and serves as a fitting environment for these two dark lords to have their bout. Oh yeah, that's another thing this episode has over Bowser vs. Ganon. The matchup is actually fitting. Nigh immortal final bosses that have mastered dark magic and are locked in an eternal battle with lines of heroes that stretch across multiple eras. That's way more interesting than just, they're both Nintendo villains. Remember how I said the best 3D fights are the ones that don't have a lot going on? Well, with the SFM team, the opposite holds true. The busier, the better. There are loads of abilities, transformations, and not to mention tricks up their sleeves. Your tricks mean nothing. William T. Sopp and Stephen Kelly deliver two of my favorite performances in the show. Dracula is the best part of this episode without question. He takes the cockiness of Darkseid and goes even further with it, constantly chewing the scenery and delivering lines that I still quote to this day, whether it's ironically, But what is a man? A miserable pile of secrets. Or unironically, I am no simple vampire. I am a god. Ganon's not half bad either. His unconventional voice direction is surprisingly fitting, and it's one of the few times in this show where I feel like the actor is in genuine pain when he screams. 
this entire second form beatdown is so wonderfully brutal, and it even kind of subverts expectations. Because as we all know, whoever transforms first always loses, right? Allow us to introduce ourselves. The ending to this episode is right up there with the all-time greats. Dracula staring down the powerless Ganon as he delivers this iconic line is bone-chilling. <laughs> Before the final blow was struck, we get a tiny glimmer of hope that Ganon might pull off a miracle, only for it to be ripped away as quickly as his torso. Such a great death, man. It's a little hard to say why exactly this episode is my number one of the season over all the others. It just does so many things right in such a gothic, exciting, and ruthless way. Everything I could possibly ask for in a Halloween episode. And they did all of this with just the resources and models that were available to them in the engine. Where would we be without Sakurai Senpai and his ultimate gaming experience? If this truly was the team's way of making up for Bowser vs. Ganon, then apology accepted without question. Welcome to the family, SFM crew. I guess all that's left to talk about now is which season do I like more, this one or season 5? Ah, man, that is a really tough call this one. I know what you're thinking. Nate, if that's even your real name, how could you say such a thing so calmly? Well, I suppose it all comes down to perspective, really. Season 5, objectively speaking, is the most innovative season of the show. There's really no debate there. Animated hosts, more hand-drawn elements, live action, highly requested matchups, Unreal, the list of important milestones in the season goes on forever. But when it comes down to it, laying these seasons out side by side made me realize that season 6 simply has more episodes that I'd consider my all-time favorite. More than half of this season is a 9 or higher, and there isn't a single below average episode either. Season 5 may have done more risks, but Season 6 manages to be a little more consistent when it comes to quality. I still have tons of reverence for Season 5. It's the season that revitalized my faith in the series, after all, and the episodes that made my list are some of my favorite videos on the internet. But hey, I have to choose a favorite. I'm not just gonna be one of those critics who dances around the bush and gives a half and half political answer to appease everyone. <laughs> what is this, Channel Awesome? But that's just me. What are your favorites? seasons of the show. Have any disagreements with my list? Let me know in the comments and stay tuned for- Hey, what's this? A towel? There's a note too. Does this towel smell like chloroform? Well, I don't see what that has to do with any heavy sleepy time. <laughs> Next time on Death Battle, our good friend Nate's going to have a bad time. <laughs>